I'll just start as people are joining. I will start with um, welcoming everyone. So welcome to um, our Rewilding Network event. Uh, tonight we are joined by Jonathan, who um, owns and manages Underhillwood Nature Reserve. And it's fantastic to have him here to share his experiences around rewilding at smaller scales. Um, for anyone who's new to these events, my name is Sarah King. I work for Rewilding Britain as Rewilding Network Lead. Um, if you've got any problems this evening at all, please feel free to write in the chat box if you're having any technical problems or if you can't hear or, or see what's happening. We'll have plenty of time for questions along the way. Um, we're going to stop at regular intervals after some of the sections to take a couple of questions as we go. And then there will be time at the end for a much longer Q&A session. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, and that will make it much easier for us to respond to your questions um, and, and make sure that we get that in the Q&A session. So if you could just keep the chat box to any problems that you're having or just general comments and then questions in the Q&A box. Um, hopefully everyone's familiar with Zoom now and, and can um, see where that where, where they can put that. Um, but yeah, yeah any yeah. problems, please do let us know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think we'll make a start. I think we've still got a few other people joining, um, but we've got a lot to fit in this evening, so um, we can start the webinar now. Um, so yeah, I just want to introduce Jonathan. Um, he is managing and owning under Hillwood, and he'll be able to tell you more about the Nature Reserve as we go through. So I'm just going to share my screen um, and then we'll make a start. So over to you. Oh, actually, no, I'll just start with the agenda. Sorry, Jonathan, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. It's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just in terms of the agenda for this evening, uh, we're going to start with an introduction to Underhillwood Nature Reserve. Uh, then Jonathan is going to go through the different rewilding approaches and interventions for each habitat type. And after every two sections, we're going to stop for a couple of questions. So do put your questions in the Q&A as we go. We're going to have a break after around 40, 45 minutes, just a five minute break, just to stretch legs, put the kettle on um, and just to uh, shake, shake off the uh, the uh, Zoom um, brain, I guess, in terms of looking at the Zoom for too long. And then we're going to carry on after that with what's left of the presentation and have a question and answer session at the end. Um, so please do submit um, as many questions as you have, and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. Um, so I will now pass over to Jonathan um, to start his introduction to the project. Over to you, Jonathan. Brilliant, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Something I just want to sort of, I guess, a process point right at the beginning I want to flag is I'm referring to notes. So you'll see me looking down. I've got a fair bit of detail here that I'm going to be working through this evening. So I don't want to miss things out. So you'll notice me every once in a while turning, looking to my right um, and uh, and referring to, to notes. So um, just to explain that a little tick, I guess. Um, so let's start off. So we bought um, the land in uh, 2014. Sarah, if you can bring up the first one of the barn and the, the little whips. Um, so we bought the land in 2014. Um, you can sort of get a feel for what it looked like. It was uh, completely covered. Apart, well, there was there was a five acre plantation woodland of about 30 years old. Um, the rest of the land, bar probably an acre, was covered in um, plantation. Um, Luckily, it was deciduous um, native, which is good, um, but completely covered. So it was sort of a, um, a growing monoculture. Um, so the first year, um, the back end of 2014 and 2015, um, we had two tasks which we did. Um, the first task, which was uh, working with the barns. You can see in the picture in the middle of the picture, there's this old stock barn. And over the course of, of a year, um, I worked with a builder and um, Sarah, if you can bring up the second one of the barn construction. Um, I worked with a builder, Isaac, who you can see down the bottom of the picture. Uh, we rebuilt the stock barn. And the purpose of doing that was to create a place where um, I could have meetings, I could run education programs, I could run workshops, um, a place for people to congregate, a place for me to get shelter and have lunch, all that sort of thing, and indeed a workshop on the end. Um, the two of us worked on our own, so it was, uh, um, as I say, most of a year of, of labour. Um, the second thing we did that year in 2015 was we built a big lake, or I didn't. Um, this incredibly clever guy called Dan did. Um, and he just kept on moving great lumps of 
soil around and earth around. Um, that took about two months. So that's, it's interesting in terms of, we've have it, had it for eight years, bought it in 2014, but all of 2015 pretty much was taken up with these two tasks, these two big tasks. Um, so in terms of my actual work on the land, um, I didn't really start that until the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016, which I think sort of marks um, how long I've been sort of intervening. Um, I think even before I bought the land, I spent two years looking for a piece of land. I had a very clear sense of the aims I wanted from a rewilding project. Um, interestingly, these aims, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, have stood the test of time. So sort of, you know, seven, eight years on, they are still the things that I get up in the morning and work toward. Um, and indeed, we've had significant uh, success around. So what are those two aims? So one was um, to nurture the land to become rich in biodiversity where flora and fauna could thrive and survive. And the focus always has been to create a mosaic, a series of habitats um, and as many habitats and as many habitat opportunities within the 25 acres as possible. And the second aim was to uh, provide a place for young and indeed not so young people to come to um, a place and learn about ecology, learn about nature um, and understand, build an understanding um, uh, of our natural world, if you like. And as I've said, eight years on, we still stand the test of time. Um, and we've had significant um, achievements relative to these two objectives. And I'll, I'll just speak to two, um, sorry, to speak to three, two about flora and one about people. The first butterfly count we did right back in the very early days. So the first comprehensive butterfly count we did was, was in 2016. Um, we had uh, 11 species. The last butterfly count, which we did, which we did, which was in the summer of 2020 in between lockdowns, we had 17 species. Um, in my part of the world, in, 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 in this, this um, part of the UK, 21 species is considered to be decent um, on wheelchair butterfly conservation sites. So the numbers of invertebrates have increased over time uh, and they're consistent. The other one is over the last six years, um, somewhere between 20 and 25 barn owl owlets have fledged from under Hillwood um, and gone on their merry way. So in terms of fauna, I'm, we are ticking that box. It is a place where fauna can thrive and survive. In terms of people and the idea of engagement and educating people, um, four young people have gone on to study things like ecology, animal behavior, conservation, forestry from a thing I run called the John Muir Award. Um, I'll talk about one of them, a young lad called Harry, who's had a, a really key involvement, um, had lots to do with the land over the last four or five years. Um, and so uh, I'm educating people and they're going on to uh, further their education in, in, in sort of nature. Um, and indeed, it's really lovely. A young, lovely young woman who comes at the moment called Noor is about to start at Sparshalt studying um, ecology and animal behavior. So that bit is really sort of heartening and fulfilling. Um, before I go on to talk about the habitats, there's a, a, a key point I want to make. And I guess those of us in the audience who know a bit about rewilding sort of understand this, but I think it's something that I'd, I'd like to reinforce. So rewilding is not about abandoning land. So what you'll hear me talk about is me intervening. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to do is be a proxy for grazing animals. So I, when I run my workshops, I talk about it, uh, about me being like an auric. So being like a grazing ungulate. Um, so I do, uh, I do small interventions and then I repeat the interventions as opposed to doing big things uh, at any one time. Another way of looking at this is I sort of nudge and then I assess the result of that and I nudge a little bit more and I assess the results uh, of it and nudge a bit more. So there is a sort of process, but I don't do things uh, in a big, bold way, if you like. Um, and as I said right at the beginning, what I'm aiming for is I'm aiming for a mosaic of habitats. So that's my introduction done. Uh, first habitat we're going to look at is the lake and the marsh. Um, I've talked about us building this lake. Um, it was interesting. Sarah has been, these guys have been amazing. Sarah, I forgot to thank you. I want to thank these guys. Rewilding Britain have just been, and Sarah has been extraordinary to work with over the last couple of months. When Sarah first came to the land, um, 
she made a really good point to a group of people who we were working with that day. She said, hydrology is the key. And digging this, this, this lake and putting it in and letting it develop and letting it grow uh, was like flicking it some sort of eco switch. This, this has made, of all the interventions, this has had the greatest single impact, this, this, this particular habitat. Um, to give you a sense of its size, um, it's 90 meters long, it's 30 meters wide at its widest point. Um, it's got multiple depths. So if you look at the far left hand end away from the island, um, it's about three meters deep. As you come back towards the island and then go to the right of the island, it's about a meter deep. Variable water heights, water depths rather are absolutely crucial. Um, it ensures that you've got cool water in summer, so you've got variable temperatures and different aquatic invertebrates require different depths. I can't remember, it might be common hawker. One of the exuvia require about two meters um, for their two year sort of exuvia stage and they require dark, cool water. So different heights are absolutely critical. Um, and an island, an island in the lake is key for nesting water birds. So they're not being predated on. The range of species um, associated with the lake is just extraordinary. And it really is this thing of, of, of flicking an ecological switch. And I've just, I've written down a few examples that we get here on a sort of regular basis. Um, tufted ducks, there were about six tufted ducks on the, on the lake at the moment. They tend to nest um, each spring. Uh, each summer we get kingfisher, which come to hunt on the lake. They nest somewhere in the bank. Um, to the west of, there's a, a, a stream bank to the west of, um, of the land. We get a range of dragonfly species, and I won't go through all of them um, that I mentioned in the, the manual, which some of you I know have bought. Um, wonderful thing you get in summer nights at night is Dorbenton bats in vast numbers, sort of crisscrossing. Um, there's a fantastic ecologist I work with, Gareth Harris, who might be on this call. And um, Gareth and I have been, we've stood on the, on the, uh, the, the jetty, down the far end and a couple of times with big flashlights. And these bats are just crisscrossing the water, water body and that's amazing. Um, heron, there's been two herons working their way up and down the pond, plundering to toads and frogs over the last couple of months. They, they, they sort of tip up, it's, it's amazing. They seem to know when the toads and frogs have arrived for mating. Um, toads and frogs in huge numbers. So again, Gareth this fantastic ecologist I work with. Um, from the island down to the right, um, last year the count was about 150 to toads and frogs. This year I counted 140 something. So we get a big assemblage of to toads and frogs breeding in the lake. Um, grass snakes, amazing number of grass snakes, little grebe, and I could go on. It, 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 this is the thing that made the single, single biggest difference, as I've already talked about. Um, yeah, this, this is a very nice thing that happened to me about a, a month ago. Perfect timing for this, this webinar. Somebody emailed me a picture through the website uh, of a lake, similar dimension, similar aspect. Um, and they couldn't understand why they were getting no fauna. So they had this really nice lake. It had been, they, they dug it about four or five years ago and they got nothing on it, save a couple of swans. And it was really interesting when I looked at the picture, um, they had this tightly mown grass so it was part of an a sort of extended garden, big garden, somewhere in Wiltshire, um, with about sort of, you know, three or four centimetre grass all the way around the margin. Uh, one of the, and the reason you don't get, or she didn't get any fauna is because there's no protected margin around the lake. So one of the things that I, and you can see in the picture that I've very purposefully encouraged is a nice big wide margin of protective um, uh, uh, foliage around the lake itself. So that's a mix of sedge, bramble, log piles, um, single bits of wood, um, marsh marigolds and things and, and water mint that are making their way out of the water and onto that margin. It's really crucial to have that because you're providing protection for a lot of um, species like frogs, toads, newts um, that spend part of their life cycle in the water and then emerge to become um, land-based uh, land-dwelling animals. Um, I don't know whether she's changed or they have changed the way that they're managing their lake, but, it, but the, the margin of the lake is absolutely crucial. An interesting thing that I've read um, in one of my new naturalist books, uh, one of those, those books that I've read, is that toadlets and froglets um, stay within 15 meters of the water body they have um, um, pupated and then emerged from. Um, 
So uh, if you don't have a nice big wide margin, then you are unlikely to get a large number of froglets and toadlets surviving. They will be predated too heavily, uh, sort of sitting ducks. Um, and similarly for things like grass snakes, grass snakes require big, nice wide margin to it affords protection and reduces predation. Um, you can see as you look at the picture closer to, um, uh, to, to, to this edge of the picture to the left is this sedge marsh. So you, if you remember back to the initial slide, there was this great sort of um, uh, swamping of the land with, um, uh, with whips. It really was an example of wrong trees in wrong places. Um, the oaks were just sitting in sort of waterlogged marshland. When we built uh, or Dan dug the lake, um, we blocked the sedge marsh off, so it flooded itself with water. It's really damp. It's sort of quite difficult to walk through it in the winter. Um, I took all the trees out. Most of the trees were given away, um, and I've let um, this soft rush and sedge marsh establish itself over these six years, um, and that's become a sort of really nice habitat which works in sort of unison with things that go on in the lake. So in the summer, I see dragonflies hunting in, in the marsh. Um, you get lovely invertebrates like wasp spiders proliferate in the marshland. Um, I see grass snakes frequently uh, up, in this, up in this area. Um, most winters now we get snipe, uh, which winter over in this marshland. And this was amazing this year. For the very first time in the winter of 2021, 22, so the winter that's just gone, every single night I was at the land and I could never quite count accurately how many but somewhere between four and six woodcock would come in from the woodland to the north and I would see them sort of darting in as right on dark and as I say you couldn't really count them you'd sort of hear them and then see these flashes and they would obviously be spending then the night um, foraging around the the lake area and in this marshland so having that, that sort of rough ground near your lake or your pond is absolutely crucial. Um, and I sort of go back to the email that was sent to me. Um, yeah, I've written here, mentioned Harry. So I've mentioned Harry, who's one of the young people who's had an association with Underhill Wood for a long time. Harry um, is completely brilliant. Harry, um, having worked with me for about a year or two, I guess, in holidays, and him and I have done lots of lovely things together. He um, requisitioned half his family garden uh, and they built put a fence up and over a weekend him and his dad put in this this little pond they went and built bought one of those sort of pro forma lining things um and uh, by that next summer and he did it in an autumn by that next summer um he had dragonfly species he had um and, and he and he rewilded um he let bramble grow he planted a little holly bush he planted a gorse bush um but the pond was interesting so he had frogs toads newts um, it had a slow worm and dragonflies and damselflies all within that first summer. So any size, right? You know, I think there's a really important thing about any size of lake or, or pond. Um, it's the one thing that I think make, makes this the biggest single difference. So that's uh, lake and marsh covered. I have no idea how I'm going for time, Sarah. <laughs> You're doing so, fine. I think, yeah, what? You're doing fine. <laughs> the next thing to talk about is pasture um, and how I've managed managed this at the land and the results we get from that management. Um, so we have seven acres in total of pasture um, at the land. What I'm trying to recreate here, and I use, I put emphasis on that word recreate, um, is a type of grassland that was common in our prehistory, history, historically in the UK, called rough grassland. Um, uh, and I must acknowledge it's not, not that I didn't come up with this. Um, it's something that the Barnow Conservation Trust described, uh, Barnow Trust described really brilliantly in their um, handbook called the Barnow Conservation Handbook. Um, I'd recommend get it because if you have any pasture, irrespective of whether you've got Barnells or not, it sort of teaches you um, uh, about uh, creating rough grassland. Um, what's the primary aim of this? type of grassland is to produce the highest numbers of field voles that you possibly can. That's what I'm looking for as an outcome from the seven acres of pasture that we now have at the land. Um, so what is rough grass? Let me describe what it is. So when it occurs naturally, uh, it occurs where grazing levels are extensive, 
um, i.e. not intensive, so low levels of animals and ungulates. Um, uh, what you end up with if you've got low levels of ungulates grazing land is a patchwork where you'll have long tussocky bits, shorter bits, pieces of sort of sward um, that might be sort of, you know, four or five inches, some that might be sort of three or four feet, and you end up with this lovely mosaic of, of uh, and a patchwork field system. I said right at the beginning that I, I, I take the role, I'm the proxy for the ungulate. So how do I achieve it? I achieve it by cutting all the fields, all the, 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 the fields that I have at Underhill Wood on a three year rotational basis. So each field is divided into three and I cut a third each year. So you can see the piece that's in front of you uh, in the front of the picture, which is long and it's got those lovely dock heads. Sarah's sort of moving her cursor over it, I think. Um, yes, that bit there. Um, that is three years old and it's all sort of lumpy and clumpy and it's got old dock in it. And that is the piece that it then cut that third. Um, and you set up this rotation in your field. Um, there's a really key point. So that's I, just, just to sort of emphasize that, that's how you then go about creating uh, this rough grassland is that sort of rotational cutting. In the Barn Owl Conservation Handbook, uh, if you don't have time, inclination, not enough land, you can do it on a two year rotation. The interesting thing is, I find doing it on the third year is um, I get more invertebrates. I'll come to the whole idea of Barn Owls being indicator species. I get more invertebrates. And with things like the, um, the heads of those dock, I get fantastic numbers of, of goldfinches. Uh, sorry, of bullfinches um, in summer. There was, uh, sorry, in summer, in winter. There was one winter about three or four years ago where I had 20 bullfinches, 10 females, 10 males. They pair up in the winter. Amazing. Um, so how do I actually um, uh, create this? I've talked about it. One thing that is really a key point if you're mowing to create rough grassland is to ensure that you don't mow below 15 centimetres. So I have my mower on the tractor adjusted to ensure that I'm not cutting any lower than 15 centimeters. If you cut below 15 centimeters, you destroy the underlying thatch that sits um, at the base of the grass. Um, if you destroy that, then you're destroying the field vole um, runs and indeed their burrows, and they will then abandon that bit of the field. If they're abandoning that bit of the field, then you're reducing total numbers. Um, and if you're keeping the, the, that nice deep thatch to 15 centimeters, then you'll ensure that uh, there's a retention of, uh, of fuel voles. One of the points I've made here is um, overgrazing always destroys uh, that underlying thatch. So if you go for a decent walk across um, most grazed uh, pasture in the UK, it's unlikely to see a 15 centimeter thatch. Um, it's one of the reasons why barn owls particularly are under so much pressure. A great quote um, from my mate Rick Lockwood um, at the Barn Owl Conservation Trust is, um, barn owls don't eat boxes, they require this habitat. Um, so this, it's something to think about. And barn owls will range, a mature barn owl will range over about 5,000 uh, hectares, so significant amount of land, and they will, they will learn uh, productive plots of land. Um, so the barn owls that live at Underhill with nature is ever likely to roam over a significant, um, uh, significant range. And if they find a piece of land that produces high field voles, then they will revisit that on a, on a sort of regular basis. Um, as I've alluded to, um, this type of field management is, um, is, it produces high number of voles. It is therefore highly attractive to, to barn owls and they are a, a species under threat. Um, they should be endangered, they're not because of uh, a, a reclassification of DEFRA, but anyway, let's not go there. Um, <laughs> the other species that I get because of this um, is uh, I get kestrel doing the day shift. So kestrel hunt on the land and they will hunt in the day and the barn owls will hunt at night. In the summer, because it's rich in invertebrates, um, I get fly catches, um, I get jays, I get corvids, um, I've talked about the wintering bullfinches, um, and I see lots of small mustelids and foxes and so on. Um, the badgers uh, will come and forage in this field. So this type of management gives rise to really, really prey rich um, uh, um, field systems that are attractive to a range of fauna. Um, the last thing to talk about before we go to our first Q&A is um, you'll notice, and Sarah, if you could wiggle your little 
your little cursor there in the middle of the shot, right at the back of the field. And again, this is something to think about if you've got a little bit of pasture and you want to create um, rough grassland is to put in hunting perches, not only for barn owls, but also for other species. So I have, I've got about 20 of these. I move them around, I sit them alongside, once I've done the cutting and I come into autumn and winter, I sit them alongside the long pieces of grass. They're really important for barn owls. Why are they important? Uh, they enable the barn owl to do a thing called post hunting, or in this case, perch hunting. Uh, and they get used all the time. I see the barn owls using these perches on a, on a really regular basis. So the barn owls can then hunt, but be stationary. Um, and they're not using valuable calories and energy and resources to stay in the air. Um, and I, as I say, I have a number of these. Um, and in fact, it, it, you know, it, there's, in this field, I've probably got a dozen of them. So I have them marching across the field, um, providing those opportunities. Um, Interestingly, in the summer, uh, flycatchers, and, and I can never quite work out why, I understand why the flycatchers use them, jays use them all the time, but I guess that is probably just about sort of, you know, um, you know they're going for invertebrates as well. So, Sarah, we're into our first Q&A, and I'm going to have a slug of water. Thanks, Jonathan. We've got a few questions in, keep them coming, and um, we'll get through a couple of them now and then um, carry on with them at the end. So um, one, there's a couple of questions about the lake, Jonathan. Um, uh, John's been asking whether the lake's lined and whether there's any ecological advantages or disadvantages to different lining methods. Um, and we've also had a question about someone up in um, Northwest Scotland wants to create a large pond. Should the lake be lined and how do you pick the right spot hydrology wise? So, um... Uh, it, it, yeah, sorry, I can't answer the question. <laughs> the reason I can't answer the question is uh, the, the Underhill Wood um, sits on a thing called Kimmeridge clay. And in fact, they used to make bricks um, in this area. Um, and indeed, you could make you could do pottery from the clay. It's really high quality. So no, the, 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 the pond um, isn't lined because we're on clay. And we did this thing called puddling, which is basically sort of compacting the clay base. Um, so I don't really have an answer. I, 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 because I've not done it, it's not something I know about. Um, if you buy the manual, I'll do another a little promotional sort of plug for the manual. Uh, in there, I quote um, some resources where you can go and find out about other sort of methods of, for um, constructing. I, I know people, I know for a fact, I've got people who I've had through my sort of network of, of other people who have little rewilding projects. People do build. Uh, decent sized ponds and uh, ponds with lining. So I know that's possible. Um, the hydrology point is interesting. So what I did, what I was asked to do by the person I employed to, um, uh, to, to site the pond was in the autumn, build a series of test pits, dig a series of test pits, build, sorry, dig a series of test pits. So these were about a sort of a, a basically post holes so about a meter to a meter and a half deep, um, you know, a, a spade or two uh, wide, get all the soil out. And then as you go through the, through the winter, where are the wettest and driest bits of your land? Um, so what we did was I had the, the, I, the land, um, the lay of the land, the way that the land formed, this was really the only place we could put the lake. I didn't have a, a plan B, but what we did too was move it, do we move it more to the west or more to the east? So I dug a series of these little pits and it was interesting about where the bank is that you're looking at in this picture, just to the, to the right, sorry, to the left of the boat, the land started to dry out as I then worked my way westward. So that was the extremity of it. Um, something I got, I, uh, one of the things I write about in the manual is, is utilizing um, the small wild, various small wildlife charities that we have in the UK and they're just amazing, they're incredible. Um, a bit like Sarah, um, and they, they, they give time and they give advice and they give input and they give expertise. I consulted with the, the Dragonfly Society um, uh, about the, the situation of the lake and the sighting of the lake. And one of the things they talked to me about was having shelter to the north, the east and the west of your lake and open to the south. Um, I certainly think, and, and for understandable reasons, if you've got your lake exposed to cold northeasterly winds, um, it's going to be a less conducive environment. 
that the lake at Underhillwood Nature Reserve is, is really sheltered. Um, subsequent to owning the land and with climate change, I've gone and planted some goat willow to the south of the lake to create some shade so I don't get sort of algal blooms and things. So I hope, I hope that's answered the question. Perfect. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in, so please keep them coming and um, we'll get to them at the end. But just one um, quick question while we're talking about pasture. Um, Sean's asking, how many acres of grassland do you have to support barn owls? Uh, Sean, anything. So it's this idea that a barn owl has a massive range and um, buy and read the Barn Owl Conservation Trust Handbook. It's incredible. I didn't quite believe this. And I've got to know David Ramson at Barn Owl Conservation really well. They, they, they will hunt over a range of 5,000 hectares. So if you've got an acre and you manage it like this uh, and the Barn Owl, the Barn Owls, once they get to about year two, they then start learning their range. Barn Owls are not territorial. So they will cross each other's flight paths. They will come to your acre if it's vol rich. And the really nice thing that you can do is if you put a box up for them, a, 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 you know, if you've got your one acre with a box and that's at the extremity of their range, then you're providing somewhere for them to come and hunt on a winter's night and then get shelter. But you can do any size, absolutely any size. I've got a friend who was meant to be on this call um, and Jonathan has got a large garden. So what he, what has he got? Half an acre, I guess, that he, that he manages like this and he gets barn owls every night. So any any bit of land, you know. Um, so yeah, there's there's no lower limit to that. Perfect. Um, we will keep going with the presentation, but keep your questions coming in, and we will get through as many as we can. So um, I'll move on. Happy to nine. What are people saying on chat? Oh, that's okay. Lots. A couple of people are leaving, and um, oh, okay. uh, there's a couple All of other right. questions there. They, they in. <laughs> that's good. No complaints. <laughs> no, no complaints. You're okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So the next thing, stream. Talk about the stream. Um, so we were really lucky when we bought the land uh, that it had a stream. That was, for me, was a, a major sort of point of attraction. Um, so there's a, a lovely little stream that runs from right through the heart of Underwood Nature Reserve. Um, and when we bought it, um, indeed, I remember this the first time we walked it, um, the stream bed had been sort of habitually cleaned by the previous owners. So the stream bed itself, it was a bit like what, you're, what you can see in that picture on the left-hand side. It was all completely free of, um, of, of, of any debris and any sort of fallen sticks or branches. They were all out on the side. So sort of the banks were covered in the detritus of the irregular cleaning process. So over the, over the past seven years, I've, I've, I've reversed all of that. Um, so what I do um, in, in the stream bed is I introduce um, logs, branches, big lumps of wood. And I will just do that if I'm doing a little bit of hazel coppicing, I might throw a big piece of hazel in. Um, if I'm felling some, you know, I'll talk about how we manage the woodland a little later on, but I might throw a big lump of ash or a big lump of oak. Um, and now what I have through the stream is I've got areas that are, I've got lots and lots of bits of timber that are crisscrossed that are blocking the stream. I've got areas that flow freely. Um, I might, have an area where I've just got one log. Um, and there's a, there's a key point about why you do that. So rotting timber, timber that's um, in stream beds and in riverbeds and watercourses, as it slowly rots down, it hosts aquatic invertebrates. And that's really key. So they become key sources of, um, of habitat for, for aquatic invertebrates. The other key thing is as it rots down, this is something that I've read in a couple of the books that I quote in the manual, is it releases mineral, minerals into the water. So you're getting a much more healthy um, uh, um, water type as it moves through your land if you're using rotting timber because it releases minerals slowly over time. And it acts as a filter. So I'm completely convinced, and, and I've not surveyed this, I've not had the water tested, but I'm completely convinced that the water that leaves under her wood is purer than the water that enters under her wood because of all these obstructions. Um, the other thing that I've done, um, the, under, the, the John Muir kids who come to Underhill Wood Nature Reserve completely love this. I've made three of these leaky dams. Um, they call them beaver dams. It's the thing that they love to do most. Um, and these are just amazing. These are really amazing, uh, the effect these have. Um, you can see how I sort of construct them. Actually, we've evolved. The, the, we did a whole module on beavers. So we've now got, we've got one that looks like a beaver dam. We've sort of moved on with our design. <laughs> um, these have amazing impacts. So they slow flood water. So they're, they're, this even in, 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 a, in a deluge in winter is never in spate now. 
because of we've got these breaking that flood water up. Um, they trap sediment. And in fact, you can see on the right hand side the color of the water in the little pond area. Again, when it's in the middle of winter and it's in spate, you'll notice that the, 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 the little pond bits are completely full of sediment. Um, and in summer, this is when these things really kick in is in summer. So in the summer, as the, the, the stream goes down to a trickle and these little lakes diminish in sort of water volume, if I go down there on a sort of July afternoon when it's 23, 24 degrees, these things are just clouds of invertebrates with things like hunting dragonfly, you know, sort of butterflies, um, day moths, solitary bees, um, dragonflies, damselflies, just everything. They're amazing. They're just invertebrate, tra invertebrate traps. So, so I would recommend doing these uh, in the stream bed. So that stream's done and now, oh, indicator species. Yeah, let me just go back to this on my notes. The really heartening thing about this is um, since we started doing this management and when did I see the first water shrew about four years ago, I now see water shrew. And the water shrew are real indicator species um, of, of, of uh, water course health. So their prey, their prey species is um, uh, aquatic invertebrates. So there's clearly enough aquatic invertebrates for this wonderful nocturnal mammal um, to sustain itself. I haven't seen them, they're nocturnal, so they're quite hard to see, um, but I have seen the water shrew three or four times. Sorry, sir, now we can go on. Next, habitat hedges. Um, this, uh, I got, I, I, I lost, I seriously lost sleep in my first couple of years of owning under Wood Nature Reserve, trying to imagine what the hell was I going to do with the hedges, um, and I didn't want to flail them, I didn't want sort of heavy machinery, and then I was sort of trying to think of creating some sort of scaffolding system on the, the tractor trailer, and I it just, I spent ages sort of losing sleep about this, and Gareth Harris, this fantastic ecologist who um, gives me wonderful sort of knowledge, advice, and expertise, taught me this thing called Conservation Hedge Lane, which has become a real feature of Underhillwood Nature Reserve. And I'll talk about Harry's research, um, he's writing his dissertation at the moment, uh, about this practice. Um, so what we've got in shot here, um, before I go on and talk more sort of in, in greater depth about Conservation Hedge Lane, is um, a hedge that's just been laid. So I took this picture immediately after the lane. If you look at the bottom of that bit of black thorn on the left, you can see the wood is quite quite clean. Um, so it's a really, really poor cousin um, to sort of conventional traditional hedge lane for, for the purposes of enclosing stock. So you don't take any of any, any electric branches off. Um, I, I clear a path so I can get access to the bottom of each of the plants. You cut right at the base and you lean them over no more than about 10 degrees. So you obviously want the crown of your plant uh, above the base and you lay uphill. Um, and as I say, this has become a real feature uh, of Underhillwood Nature Reserve. So Sarah, if you can go to the next one, which is the first section I ever did. So we laid, Conservation Hedge laid this section um, uh, about five years ago. Um, it's about uh, 20 feet high and about 30 feet deep. Um, it feathers away into a ride. There's a ride which runs away to the right. And then I've got this lovely successional growth of, um, of nice tussocky grasses, emergent black thorn and things and bramble running into the base of that hedge. Um, and let me go back a little bit. I've slightly skipped on my notes here and talk about why are these so important. Um, Fantastic book I really liked was, uh, which I read a couple of years ago, was Ben McDonald's book, Rebirding. And there's a fantastic chapter in Rebirding about hedgerows and the role that hedgerows, if managed properly, can play um, in our sort of broader ecosystem. So basically what hedgerows are, according to, and indeed it, I, I think the evidence is beginning to show this at Underhillwood Nature Reserve, is they are proxies for our our old um, uh, woodland pasture. Because what you've got on the left is, if you think about what, what are you creating when you're conservation hedge lane, you're creating um, uh, a, a linear, contiguous, connected series of, of trees that provide nesting opportunities, fruit opportunities, um, roosting opportunities, browsing opportunities for, for lots of small mammals, um, lots of opportunities for invertebrates. And um, 
uh, and on and then on the right hand side you're creating this sort of this pasture element so that sort of de facto wood pasture um, they sort of take that role um, McDonald claims the reason we have some of the bird species we have in the UK is because of of hedgerows and they they their replacement habitat if you like um, so I've written here these structures replicate our natural natural national uh, our natural past I think they do um, as I've talked about, it produces this really dense, broad, deep, wide hedgerow. Um, I lay these in about, this is a key point, in about 20 to 30 meter sections. I never do that, do more than about that. Um, I'll do, this winter I did, I think we did three sections across the land at different places. The reason I do that is um, to respect um, particularly bat flyways. So bats will use hedgerows to, to fly up and down and that gives them protection. They use them for navigational purposes. Um, so to take out any more than say 30 meters is, is potentially disruptive for bats. Um, so that's why I do these in these sections. Um, and it follows my thing of not just this, not just this, that idea of my gentle interventions. Um, what are the results of this? Um, so we have dormice in Underhill Wood Nature Reserve. Um, Gareth Harris um, runs that bit of the project. He does a monitoring program every year. Um, the dormice were always sort of stuck in the south, sorry, in the northwestern corner of the land. So we first found them there and we found them in subsequent years in this northwestern corner. For the very first time last year, um, we found dormice in the eastern um, bits of, of Underhill Wood Nature Reserve. So perhaps they were there all along, or as I like to sort of fancifully imagine, they have migrated from the northwestern corner to the eastern bits of the land because of Conservation Hedge Lane. That may not be the case, but certainly what Conservation Hedge Lane is doing, if you think about the needs of dormice, is it's creating habitat which is completely conducive to dormice. Um, you know, lots of cover material for nest building. I guess you know dormice are successional feeders, so they require different things at different points in the year, and these hedges provide that for them. Um, another result that um, was really heartening was in the winter of 2021, so not this winter, but the previous winter, I had huge flocks of um, field fears, missile thrushes, red wings, and blackbirds, blackbirds, massive flocks of them, um, uh, there in the daytime and there at night. Um, and they were occupying, it was really interesting where they were occupying. They were occupying the hedges, which I'd laid um, four, five, three years ago, that sort of age that had some, some age and some structure. And clearly again, because a bit like the dormice, um, it's giving them a range of opportunities, food, protection. Um, the last thing that indicates before we go to our second Q&A, um, the benefit of these um, lovely young Harry or and this lovely guy who comes to the land who's at Aberystwyth University doing his, um, uh, his undergraduate degree. He did his third year dissertation on conservation hedge lane. Um, as I speak, um, he's been working on his first draft and doing some number, number crunching around this. Um, what he's shown, um, and as I say, he's doing number crunching, so I can't give detailed numbers of this yet. And I will in due course. And indeed I'll put it on a blog, Harry's dissertation. But what he's showing in, in, is that in these, in the older hedges, which were laid four or five years ago, we have an increase, not only in terms of biodiversity, but bioabundance of a factor of about 1.5 to two. So that is really significant uptick, up increase in biodiversity of, of invertebrates. And Sarah, you, I think I've got this, if I got pronouncing this right, he's finding uh, a particular increase in uh, saprophytes. And from my understanding, saprophytes are invertebrates which each which eat um, decaying material and sit right at the bottom of that sort of cascade, that tropic cascade. So I, I you know, anybody who's got any hedges, do this. Um, it, it completely works. So Sarah, Q&A, I'm just going to close a door. Um, um, we'll, close. Um, that's okay. We're just coming up to quarter past seven. So we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll have our five minute break so that everyone can have a bit of a stretch, um, but we have a question about, um, do you need to get permission to affect the flow of the stream? So um, based on your leaky dams, was that something that you needed to get permission for? 
Um, uh, I, no, uh, well, I, I, I can't say because I don't seek that sort of stuff out. I think if you're I, affecting, I um, yeah, I think if you're affecting a main river, um, you have to get environment agency permission. So double check um, on your maps and and make sure that you're aware of whether you have a main river or whether it's something that you need to get EA. Um, and I think it also depends on where you are. Some uh, planning authorities require you to put in permission as well. So, so always check that out. Um, and just quickly before we go to our break, um, Christopher is asking, um, is there a reason why you're not using cattle at low grazing densities on the pasture instead of imitating their behavior by cutting the grass? Oh, uh, Christopher, very, very moot point. I'm tr trying to live at the land to, in fact, to affect that. Um, I live half an hour away from Mount Hillwood Nature Reserve and I grew up on a dairy farm. I understand how you sort of manage cattle. You need to see them pretty much on a daily basis. Um, and it just isn't practical to have animals on the land and me being half an hour away from them. That's the only reason. And um, we're in a sort of a bit of a royal battle with uh, a range of stakeholders at the moment, trying to, to, to get ourselves uh, on the land so I could have conservation grazing. It, it, it would be the next thing and it would be a complete game changer. It would, it would shift um, uh, things at the land significantly. Perfect. OK, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, we are going to have a couple of minutes break. Um, if you want to go and stretch your legs, please go now. Um, otherwise, I will tell everyone about the rewilding network. Um, so feel free to stay and I'll do a couple of minutes. Um, but if you need to go and take a comfort break, please do. Um, so I will just share my screen. Um, so I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just talking about the rewilding network for anyone who wasn't familiar um, with the network leader um, and the rewilding network if we've got any new people joining us today. Um, so yeah, my name's Sarah King. I'm rewilding network lead. Um, the network uh, started at the beginning of last year, so it's still pretty new. Um, we, we're about 14 months in at the moment. And the aim of it really is to bring together landowners, land managers, project managers who are rewilding at scale um, and to try and help facilitate knowledge exchange, do webinars like this one, um, and also just to try and build a range of practical resources around how to rewild. So one of the things that we know about rewilding in Britain um, is there's a kaleidoscope of different approaches. Each site is unique and it doesn't matter what projects we get coming to join the rewilding network. They're all unique in their own ways. They're slightly different approaches. And this makes it quite difficult to um, try and establish how to rewild because it very much depends on your land, what you've got there, what habitats you've got, the hydrology, the environmental conditions um, and, and the different space that you have, because there might be some opportunities where you don't have space to bring cattle and, and herbivores in. Um, and you might need to mimic that by hand when you're working at smaller scales. So this is just a, an example of some of the, the different projects um, that are on the network and, and just understanding that they have a whole variety of different approaches and we see unique things happening um, across all of the sites. We've got a growing number of projects on the map, um, so do go on our website and check it out. That We've got an increasing number of, of projects and we're starting to showcase all the different approaches that they're taking. It's not an exhaustive list, um, we're starting with the la larger projects, um, but really this is to start to showcase what's happening across the whole of Britain and trying to connect people up with other rewilding projects. Um, and as I said, we're building up the evidence base all the time, so we're starting to pull together information about the network, um, we've done analysis to look at the number of jobs that have been increased from rewilding. Um, this number has actually gone up to over 50% increase in jobs um, and a 14-fold increase in volunteering opportunities. So through the rewilding network, we can start to pull some of this information together and really build the evidence base for rewilding. Um, so that was just a really brief introduction. As I said, if you join the rewilding network, it's free to join. It's open to anyone who's got land at any scale. Um, who are rewilding. Uh, you can um, apply to join through our website and really we're just trying to help facilitate knowledge exchange through webinars, through handbooks, um, content um, and there's also lots of content on our website as well um, to try and provide as much support as we can. Um, it's still really early days but we've got lots of plans to bring in um, more content and more webinars going forward so I would encourage anyone to um, check out check out joining the network if you haven't already. So that was just a brief interlude. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to stretch their legs. Um, do you still keep getting your questions into the Q&A? Um, and we will get through as many as we can. 
Um, but I will share my screen and pass back to Jonathan, if that's okay, Jonathan. Yep, sure, thank you. Good, so let's carry on. I hope everyone's had a, a, a bit of a break. Um, so built structures. So it's a, a bit of a feature at under Hillwood Nature Reserve that we use built structures. Some of those built structures are proxies for things that existed in history um, in our ecosystem in the UK that no longer exist or don't exist in enough um, uh, sufficient numbers. And indeed other built structures that then replace things that are being lost. Um, so Sarah, bring up the first one, which is the Barn Owl Hotel. Um, so again, working with Barn Owl Conservation people, we built, um, there's not many of these in the UK. This was a prototype when I built it. This thing really works. Um, so this is, I call it the Barn Owl Hotel. It's 1.75 meters from its base to its apex, one and a half meters deep and one and a half meters wide. And it's a proxy, um, if you sort of think about what is the natural uh, nesting place for a Barn Owl, it's a hollow in um, a hole in a hollow in a big ancient um, oak or something. Um, and who would nature reserve doesn't have any ancient trees. We've got veterans, but we don't have ancients and ancients are sort of scarce within our ecosystem. So this is a direct proxy for, for that space, if you like, um, and it works. This thing has been occupied almost since the day we put it up. The second um, example is, uh, and indeed it's it's sort of the same proxy, if you like, as we rewild honeybees and under who wouldn't under who would nature reserve, um, and this this in fact replicates the same thing. So this is basically a log um, on stand on a stand three legged stand, and it's replicating exactly the same thing, which is a a hole in an ancient tree. Um, and because we don't have any ancient trees and no holes, we don't have any wild honeybees at the land. I put these in, I've got two of these. And so we now have these rewilded honeybees, which we don't take any from. Um, so those are a couple of examples. The one I want to focus on um, a bit more is, um, is this, which is uh, something we call the barn owl barn, but it's uh, multifunction and multi-purpose, if you like. Um, so after the second beast from the East in 2018, I arrived at the land to find a dead barn owl, which was really upsetting. Um, sort of around that time, and we'd seen this barn owl hunting in the winter in the middle of the day, which is never a good sign. My wife and I had been talking about um, the harshness of that winter and the barn owl's needs. It happened to be um, just at exactly that moment, I was reading a fantastic book by a guy called John Martin, J.R. Martin. And one of the things that he points out is not only the huge decline of barn owls from 120,000 odd in the 1930s to 8,000 odd now, um, he talks about the fact that we've taken so many barns out of um, open barns, um, out of the habitat, out of the ecosystem, you know, they're either being converted into houses um, or indeed the modern, modern barns are, are sort of sealed up. So we've, we've removed this really key winter habitat for barn owls. Um, so we built this, um, and a little bit like the barn owl box, we built this in, uh, in October, November. It was used that very first winter. Um, uh, Sarah, if you can go to the next slide, and then I'll talk a little bit about sort of um, uh, the internal structure. Yes, in fact, I, one of the things I've noted down here was the camera trap. I'll, I'll, exp I'll describe and explain internally what goes on in this barn in a moment, but let me just talk about that first winter. So I put the camera trap, we have two camera traps, one takes stills. I put the stills camera trap in this barn um, at, the, at the beginning of November and I left it in there for three months and then I did a correlation. And it was a correlation between every single wet or windy or inclement night and the presence of the barn owls in this barn. And any decent night, I kept a close eye on weather, any decent night, they didn't use the barn. So there was this absolute correlation between the needs of the barn owls who struggle to hunt a lot in the winter because of our weather conditions and the use of the barn owl, uh, barn owl barn. Um, and, and indeed, I observed them. I had this completely lovely experience a couple of winters ago, watching both of them leave their hotel, fly past me on a, as it was beginning to sort of really chuck it down and go into the barn um, and spend the night in their ISU hunting. So how did I sort of dress this internally? So I bought in these straw bales. Um, I fitted, it, fitted the internal um, structure out with those hunting perches. As you can see, that's a hazel hanging off um, uh, vertical struts in the roof. 
Um, and Sarah, can you just wiggle your cursor over that box with the brick on the top of it? No, the there down beneath. And the other thing I do is I put feed hoppers um, in here and I put layers mash in those feed hoppers to encourage um, small mammals. So this thing is 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 then full of, of small mammals, lots of rats. Um, and the barn owl barns then, the barn owls, sorry, come in and hunt uh, in this barn in, 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 in inclement weather. Um, the, the box that you can see up in that top left-hand corner, I built that, you know, Sarah's wiggling her cursor over. I built that as a, um, a summer roosting box for the adults. Um, they will leave the owlets in the box when they get to a certain size and they will go and remotely roost during the day. Um, so I built this, so this now has that sort of purpose of becoming um, uh, a winter, uh, sorry, a summer roosting site when the islets get too big for the, for the, for the adults and they use it um, all the time. Um, while we were at it um, um, and we built the barn, we thought, hang on, we built this structure, wouldn't it be good to have other things in it? So on the other side of the partition wall that you can see mid shot, on the other side of that wall, we built um, a large bat loft. Um, hasn't been used yet, but we then are providing another opportunity. Um, on each of the walls of the barn, um, we put up some big Douglas fir untreated panels of wood. Um, again, opportunity for, um, for particularly for nursery roosts, um, for bats. On the northeastern side of the barn, in fact, Sarah, can you just go back one slide? When we constructed the barn on the northeastern side, you can see we put in this big eave. So there's a big sort of meter and a half overhanging eave, and that's got a ledge. And we put swallow and house martin cups, and indeed um, other nesting opportunities. And on the southern wall, which is the one with that funny little window thing, we built a large solitary bee habitat. Um, one of the things that, and Sarah, if you go now back to the interior, I've just had, there's somebody who I'm working with at the moment, he's rewilding about four acres. Um, he's built a tiny wee version of this. It's about sort of three meters by three meters. This is about, that bit that you're looking at is about sort of, uh, it's about six meters by five meters. So you can, you can shrink this. I've got a mate of mine who lives in Scotland who has got barn owls that winter over in a, in a disused um, uh, a disused woodshed. But, but internal habitat for them over the winter is absolutely important, really crucial. Cool. Woodland. Um, so Underhill Wood Nature Reserve has six acres, uh, six acres of more mature woodland. The, this is not, well, I'm not talking about the, the, the young plantation and the whips that we had a look at at the beginning. This is, um, this is a woodland that is about 20, 30 years old. It's a plantation woodland. Um, thankfully, again, it's native deciduous, so that's good. That's a nice tick in the box. Um, but it had never been managed in any way. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it was in need of some TLC when I bought the land. Um, there's an interesting point to make here. I don't know whether people are aware of a, a really seminal piece of research that was done at Lady Jane Wood in the Wye Valley. Um, and what it clearly illustrated was if you leave woodlands in Britain, uh, particularly in, 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 our, in lowland UK, and you leave them and they just become sort of dense and overgrown and, um, and aren't broken up in any way, you get, you get less biodiversity than you do in a woodland which is, is, is disrupted in some way and has you know, that term, man it's managed. So I've done a number of things over the seven years that we've had the land to, 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 to break up what was a block. It really was a block of almost a square block of, of, of uh, six, seven acres of, of, of woodland. So I'm gonna talk about um, those in a minute. Uh, there's a point I want to make here. Um, this brilliant young undergraduate I worked with called Harry, he wrote an essay which he sent me in the second year. Apparently, the sweet spot is 20% of, of open ground um, within a woodland. And I think I'm probably there at Under Wood Nature Reserve by just creating these various features that we've put into the woodland. So I'm going to talk about each of those features. So Sarah moves on to this one. This actually isn't the woodland, but I don't have a photograph of the rides in the woodland but it, is, it illustrates, um, uh, I guess, what rides need to look like. 
So I, in the, in the, in the six acre woodland, I put in a number of rides. Um, rides have sort of multiple functions within a woodland. Um, they provide connectivity for a range of species to move around the land. So lots of invertebrates, butterflies, moths, dragonflies are very reluctant to fly over the top of trees. For obvious reasons, it increases the risk of predation. Um, and, you know, I will often, in fact, often when I'm cutting the rides on the tractor, I have a couple of dragonflies, you know, ahead of me moving down the ride in front of me. Um, so, so invertebrates uh, use the rides as passageways. If you think about it, there is the, they, they can then fly, if you think about the needs of a dragonfly, it can fly from the, the, the lake down to the woodland on a series of rides. Um, dragonflies also hunt. Um, it's brilliant. In the summer, you often see dragonflies sort of perched on a little branch in a scallop in the edge of a ride, waiting for some other poor unsuspecting vertebrate to pass by. The same applies to bats. I find, I, I notice at dusk, bats moving up and down these rides. Um, and the same applies to mammals. Um, so putting rides into your, uh, to your woodland is, is really important. And I'm going to talk at the end briefly about planting woodland and some thoughts around these structures as you plant a woodland. Um, a couple of points about rides, they need to be as wide as possible. Um, so make them as wide as you possibly can. An east-west orientation is best, not north-south. East-west gives a lot of sun on one side. North-south, you've, you've, you've got them in sort of too much shadow. Don't ever make them straight, make them weaving and meandering. That's something you can see in these pictures. They're not, they're not straight. The one on the left is a bit straight. Um, uh, and, and yes, and, and, and put in scallops and make them weave and meander as much as you possibly can. Um, the other feature that we've put in, we've put in five glades over um, the last six years. Um, this is one of the glades that we've put in. Um, I've been slightly lucky. Each of the glades that I've created, I've felled stands of um, ash with dieback. So sort of 30-year-old ash, completely riddled with dieback. So it's been quite easy to create these. Um, a couple of things about these. The, each of the glades faces south. It's got um, protection on its uh, north, east and north, and then western sides. So it gets completely bathed in sunshine and, and, and lots and lots of bright sun in the middle of summer. Um, I make these about sort of 30 meters by 30 meters. That seems to be a good optimum size. Um, and a, a, a bit like I do with the barn owl fields or just the fields, the pasture management for rough grass, and as I manage this on a three year rotation. So you can notice the piece on the left has been freshly cut. The bit in the middle is probably two years old and the bit on the far right is one year old. So I set up these rotations within the glades. Um, here, the John Muir kids, because I'm because my hearing's completely shot, I don't hear this, but the John Muir kids who come, they claim um, on a sort of hot July afternoon, they can't stand near these because of the noise that emanates from them. I don't know whether that's true or not. Sounds good. Um, a couple of times I put back detectors and there is certainly a huge volume of noise that comes from these glades. Next, um, uh, we put this in about mm, three years ago. Um, so this is a woodland pond. Um, it's quite small. It's about a meter, meter and a half deep, uh, deep at its deepest. Um, it's, it's sheltered and shaded from the south. Um, and the purpose of this, and there's lots of leaf mold that goes into it. The purpose of this is to make a nice closed sort of ecosystem to habitats for frogs. So frogs tend not to like to hibernate in the same water body that they've bred in. Um, and so this is, the, this is at the, 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 the far end of the land. So it provide, and now what I'm doing is, if you think about it, I provide an opportunity for frogs to breed in the large lake and then hibernate in this pond. And as they, they've all emerged and they're now making their way across land and they'll do that until they get to sort of autumn and they'll make their way to this pond where they can then hibernate and bury themselves in a whole lovely big pile of leaf litter. So this is something to introduce, um, to think about introduce uh, in, into your woodlands. And it, it, as I say, it closes that habitat. It means I don't have frogs particularly sort of wandering across um, roads and lanes nearby looking for water bodies to hibernate in. Um, the next thing is, is, is log piles and brash piles. Um, I think, Sarah, the first time you came to Underhill Wood Nature Reserve, you made some comment that you'd never seen so much rotting timber. 
so this this is a real thing um it's just mountains of this stuff all over the all over the woodland um and this is just great habitats for sort of toads wrens robins invertebrates and of course fungi all sorts of things if, in the in the winter if i lift up one of these sort of logs and have a look underneath inevitably there's a toad um and you get toads of different sizes um a couple of things to say about these um and i don't think you can have too many i've got dozens of them um if you're going to create these and i recommend you do um dappled sunlight is best um so dappled sunlight gives you some warmth, warmth and some moisture um it gives a greater range of sort of uh, variable little habitats um then within uh, so the sunny on the sunniest side you'll probably get more um, invertebrates that are sun loving on the sort of shaded side you'll get more invertebrates that are sort of um, sh shade loving um, uh, so you're getting variable moisture and uh, bits of moisture and variable um, uh, temperatures a, a, a thing that I do with these is as we're managing the wood and felling trees I then add to these piles each winter so there's a nice succession of um, of new wood um, from invertebrates to then um, uh, to host on and graze on a point about height, you don't really need to do these more than about a meter high. Um, uh, I, I remember I remember I did one that was about two meters high. I had this fantastic look like a castle and I had somebody come from the Amphibian Reptile Trust and he said to me, complete waste of time, the, the, the sort of the top meter was doing nothing. So I sort of dismantled it. Now I have them really, really no higher than about a meter, a meter point, 1.25 meters, something like that. Cool, done on that. Next one. Um, oh, good, we're doing well with time. I have nice time for q and at the end. Um, so when I, and I said this right at the beginning of introduction, introducing the piece around woodlands, this had never been touched, this woodland. Um, I, I don't think it had been touched since the day they were whips. Like I spent the first month hauling out plastic tree guards. It really had been abandoned. Um, so there were lots of disease, rotting trees. You know, there, there was, it, there, there was a, there was a real issue. So uh, I had an arborist come along, um, gave me some advice, suggested I needed to sort of get stuck in and, 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 and thin out the trees to create sort of light and space and sun, and, and, um, which I've done. I'm now having felled, I don't know, I'm not sure how many in total, I probably felled a third of the trees in this woodland. I'm now at a point where the canopy is open. Um, the trees that are remaining look much more he much healthier. They have a much nicer profile, which I'll talk about towards the end of the sort of slot. And I'm getting to a point where I don't really need to cut trees down anymore. So one of the things that I've started doing is I've started ring barking. Um, and this year I probably ringed, ring barked 30 odd trees, 20 trees, something, something in that order. Um, this is a habitat, rotting standing timber is a habitat that we've lost in the UK. Um, through maybe tidiness, lack of ancient trees, too many young plantations, or just health and safety concerns. And it's something I, it, it, you get different invertebrates in rotting standing timber than you do in the log piles. That's an important point to make. Um, you can achieve these. There's an interesting, I, in fact, I, I slightly sort of nicked this from a visit to Nep, Nep Rewild in the state. You can create these without having to ring bark. Um, uh, uh, trees that you, if you've got any sort of young trees on your land, it, it get, get some, bring a log in, get the log, stand it up and lash it to something. And which is what I did. I did a number of these at the beginning. I had about 20 of them where we would just lash, lash the, the, the tree that we cut down to the base of that, to, the, to its stump. Um, and, and then over the years, watch that get sort of colonized by fungus and the bark stripped off by, by hornets and things like that. Um, yeah, I've written here the benefit of, I, I think I've said it all, there's lots and lots of benefits for rotting standing timber from hornets to nuthatches to, to fungus. So it's something that I, if you've got a wooden, I would recommend you, you think about doing. Um, yeah, this is, this is interesting. Um, there's a number of really beautiful veteran trees uh, at Underhill Wood Nature Reserve, sort of trees in a range of, I guess, 120 to 160 years old, lovely big oaks. Um, and in the summer of 2019, so this was pre-pandemic, um, there was a huge northerly gale, completely hammered southern Britain, 
and I walked the land and everything was completely fine. And I got to this bit of the land in the northwestern corner. And here's this completely beautiful 130 year old oak or whatever age he or she is completely toppled. Um, so sort of momentarily, I was really upset. I was like, oh, my God, I've lost one of these beautiful oaks. And sort of quite quickly, I switched to, ah, but imagine the possibilities and the opportunities that this provides. Um, there's an interesting thing about, I guess, how I've interacted with this big oak that fell down. I think if this had fallen, if this had fallen down in the first year or two that I owned under Hillwood Nature Reserve, I think I would have taken to it with a chainsaw and probably sort of broken it up for no good reason, just because I have a chainsaw. Um, I haven't touched it. I've, I've completely left this. There's a fantastic book um, that's in the, the, the um, that I recommend everybody buys, actually. It's amazing, this book, written by a guy, a guy called um, Dr. Peter Kirby, and it's called Habitat Management for Invertebrates, and it was uh, published in 2001 by Pelagic. It's amazing. I've read it twice. One of the things that he talks about in that that I applied to this is that um, a tree of this scale will have different moisture and temperature qualities. So if you think about the bit in the middle that we're looking at, it's probably going to be warmer and drier than the bits at the extremities, which are probably going to be wetter and cooler. Um, the, the invertebrates and the um, fungi that you get in the middle bit are going to be completely different from the bit you from the invertebrates and fungi you get on the end, which have these different sort of qualities about them. And so I've just left this. Um, and something they said when we, my wife, Kegi, my wife and I went to Belowisza in Poland, they said, I think they said, that a 150 year old tree takes 150 years to completely decompose. So it could be the case that that is there for 148 more years, slowly decaying and, and decomposing. And that's amazing. It, it, even since I've taken that photograph, I'm just watching what's happened to that. Um, final points to make about woodland, um, I guess, before we then go to Q&A, and it gives us about 15 minutes, which is good. This is running for time. Um, if you're planting a plantation woodland, I'm helping somebody at the moment. Um, uh, he's doing a small rewilding project. And one of the things I've done with James is to, to, to plan in to his planting scheme, his rides, his glade, um, his glades and his woodland pond. So don't plant, you know, rather than plant a sort of block of woodland, plant in your east-west rides, plant in your glades, plant in your woodland podland, pond. So you're creating these features which can then evolve and mature as your as your young woodland evolves and evolves and mature. Uh, a point I make in, and, and again, I think I got this from Peter Kirby's book, um, and it's a point I make in the manual, is I've changed my felling regime a, a fair bit in the woodland, the plantation woodland at the land. The, according to Peter Kirby, the, the, the frequency of a chainsaw is highly disruptive to hibernating bats, and that's important. So what I now do is I try to do a lot of my work in October, November, um, early autumn in the woodland with chainsaws before bats go into hibernation. So I'm not disrupting them in the middle of a cold February day with a whining chainsaw. Um, the other thing to talk about in terms of the woodland management, and indeed I got this from Rackham's book, Woodland, and I, can't, I mean, I've looked a million times to try to sort of find this, this description. The, wood, the, the, the trees at Underhill Wood in the plantation woodland when we first got the land, they had a sort of profile like that. They were linear. So they were sort of, they, they, they didn't have much lateral growth and they had a lot of vertical growth. What's happening to the trees as I've thinned them is that is changing. So they now are, are shifting to a more of an umbrella shape. Rackham somewhere in woodlands talks about uh, the numbers of species you get with that profile compared to that profile. And it's sort of exponential. So that's what I've aimed for. And it's really interesting. You create the space for trees and they will fill it. They will, they will create um, these, actual, these actual branches. Um, and then the other thing I've written down here is understory management. Yeah, just, and it's this thing of me being the ungulate. So one of the things I'm trying to avoid in the, in the six acre plantation woodland at Underhill Nature Reserve is a complete sort of carpet of bramble. It's, I don't want that. So what I'll do is I'll go in, oh, there's a key point to make here. In fact, just to make, make my notes, I've noticed in my notes, there's a key point here, which is bramble and shade 
has less van value than Bramble and Sun uh, for obvious reasons. So Bramble and Shade doesn't have fruit and flowers. So the Bramble and Shade in the woodland, um, I get in there with either the topper on the tractor or brush cutter and I just knock it about a bit and I sort of manage it. Um, and it's this, again, back to right at the back to the beginning of the webinar, to this idea of just little nudges. But what I don't want is I don't want the understory to be six acres of, of shaded bramble. Um, and that's it. I'm done in terms of that was my last habitat. And we're finishing with a lovely picture of uh, one of the wild honeybee hive swarms. Yeah, I'll just give you a chance to have a breather, Jonathan, because um, that's oh, really? a lot of information. So well done. I'll just finish <laughs> off and then we'll go to the queue. I made and it. Give you a I'm bit still of a alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, Jonathan's just provided this um, beautiful photo of um, the wild bee swarm at um, Underhill Nature Reserve, which um, is fantastic to see. And um, it's really great to, to see these wild bees coming coming back onto the site. Um, I just wanted to finish off before we go to the Q&A. So do still get your questions in just to um, say that Jonathan has written a fantastic book um, called The How to Rewild Manual. I've got the link on here, but I will send the link around with the recording afterwards. Um, I've read it, I would highly recommend it. Um, all of the information today is in there, plus, plus more. Um, it's a really fantastic manual to show um, the work that Jonathan's been doing and he goes through all the different habitats. So um, please do consider having a look at that if you haven't already, because um, I would highly recommend it. There's a lot of fantastic information in there and it builds a lot more on some of the species that we haven't had time to go through today especially things like the barn owl work um, and, and everything else that's happening so um with that i'm going to stop sharing and uh we will go to questions uh jonathan if you're ready for them yeah i've had a breather <laughs> fantastic i have a large glass of red wine after this i tell you <laughs> <laughs> So um, Annabelle is asking, and, and I think this was a question that came in earlier, um, does bracken create habitat for voles, do you know? Uh, I suspect not, would be my answer. So, so what, vo what fuel voles require is they, they rec that, um, it, and indeed, if you go to sort of vole rich pasture, what, you, what you'll notice in that bottom 15 centimeters, so that, 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 that thatch at the bottom is a sort of densely woven, uh, cover of grass and in there they're creating their, their runs and then slightly underneath it their burrows sit just underneath the soil they're not going to get that sort of thatch um, from bracken um, and also the, the herbivorous and graniferous and so they require um, they require all the sort of the, the, their food source comes from grass so eating seed heads uh, fresh grass, grass stems, all that sort of stuff. They're not going to get a food source in bracken. Um, and indeed, bracken's toxic for us. I can imagine bracken's toxic for them. So I think my answer for that would be no. Um, I, 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 I haven't read that, but that would be my supposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple of questions. Um, Simon and Liz have both asked about whether you are considering the use of native ponies um, on your land instead of cattle. Uh, I don't have, based on the NEP, so based on, 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 on NEP, uh, their the sort of grazing, um, uh, what am I trying to describe here? Their the sort of grazing numbers, right? So the NEP, NEP worked to one animal for three hectares. And that gives me about four animals in total at Underhill Wood Nature Reserve, but I don't have four, four sorry, I don't have 12 hectares of, um, of pasture. I've got sort of less than half of that. So I would probably start with two animals. I'm actually, one of the things I will do as this progresses, if we get to live there, is talk to my neighbor who's got land that would be completely, perfectly suited to this. I couldn't really have more than say four animals. So what I might do is two horses, two ponies and two, two cattle. Um, so that's certainly in my mind, it's in the mix, um, but my grazing numbers are going to be so small that I won't have herds of anything. Um, but yes, ponies are in the mix for sure. Fantastic. Um, James has asked um, a, a financial question and whether uh, you are able to sustain sustain the expenses of the project from income generated by webinars and visitors. Um, doesn't want to wish to intrude on your private finances, but how do you make it work financially? Uh, it, James, we have a crap kitchen and a funny old car. Like it's sort of a it's a it's a it's a personal choice. So we fund it. Um, so Sarah's not paying me anything for tonight. <laughs> 
and I didn't ask. Um, so no, it's a passion of ours. We fund this. We make choices. You know, we don't take airplane flights, and this is this is how we. This is sort of, you know, without getting all pretentious and sort of lofty, this is a legacy thing. You know, you can see I've got no hair and most of it's grey. This is for me sort of the last bit of my life. So, no, we just live in a very modest little cottage. We have a crappy kitchen. It's cold as hell, damp as hell. Um, but it's it's sort of, um, it's how we choose to spend our money. There's, there is, though, another bit to the question, which is uh, it is beginning to now. Uh, it's interesting. In in It's taken eight years uh, and the development of these habitats for the, for me now to show people something. So I couldn't have done this webinar five years ago. It would have been nothing to say. I now have something to say. The land now tells a story. So um, DEFRA, fantastic getting some of my tax back, are paying me 500 quid to host a farm cluster in a couple of weeks. So actually now the land is, and I run workshops, and I, the land now is beginning to generate a little bit of money. I've got a group coming on Saturday and they are all paying a decent donation to come to the land. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, and, and I, it's interesting. One of the things that a, a, an ecologist um, who works with DEFRA made the point to me about a month ago, if I was starting this project now, I would be entitled to get ELMS related um, subsidies yeah. because I've gone and created the habitats. I can't apply for them retrospectively. So I might drain the pond. Mm -hmm. and bulldoze it and start again. <laughs> I think also worth noting, I know this isn't a route that you've gone down, but biodiversity net gain is coming through and that's something that could be um, a possible option for smaller scale rewilding projects. Um, and also just to note that um, one of our items that we've got on our network plan for the coming year is to set up a bit of a funding directory, um, specifically yeah. for smaller scale projects of what grants might be available for them. So um, watch this space because we do know that it's... Um, yeah, it's quite a tricky, a tricky thing to look at. So, um, yeah. I, I, and, and James, I was told by um, Defra right at the beginning, I, I, the land did get a fifteen hundred pound a year grant. I was told to uncouple from that because it would have demanded things of me, and I would have had less freedom. And I think the subsidy regime now is more aligned to what I'm doing and what what you're thinking of doing. Um, oh, so yeah, there, one other thing to say about that: banks. Some of the, the I, I know somebody, in fact, yes, yeah, somebody who came to one of my workshops has got a five acre rewilding project and they've got lots of grants from banks and insurance companies. So some of the, because then they can carbon offset these individuals, these, these large organizations. So that's something to look at. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, Haley has asked the question, did you receive any opposition to what you're doing? And if so, how did you overcome this? Um, I didn't receive any opposition. I, I sort of, it's interesting. I, 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 I own the word rewilding, you know, and if anybody wants to have a scrap about it, bring it on, you know, like I really do own that word. I don't have, there's, there's a whole stack of dis disinformation about what, we, what, what rewilding is. I, I think I had a level of suspicion when I first bought the land. I never had outright opposition to it. Um, but now what I hear, and in fact, I had somebody sort of knock on my on the barn door the other day in the middle of my lunch and they live over in the village. People love, you know, the, people can now sit on their balconies and have a glass of wine and watch a barn owl hunt. You know, what's not to like? So now there's pe pe people like what's going on there. Um, the interesting thing was I didn't take any farmed land out of production, right? It was covered in all those little trees. So I wasn't sort of moving in, I wasn't buying 25 acres of, of farmland. Um, I've got mates of mine who are doing this in Wales and they're having to be much, much, much more gentle and careful about the way that they sort of just gently go about their business. Yeah, of course. Um, do you have any challenge of having grazing deer on the, on the site and does that affect any of your root generation? No, because I only have roe. Actually, I've got muntjac, which might end up being a bit of a problem. Um, uh, I have roe. They're a roe. Roe are so quite sedentary and quite uh, native. And no, they're completely fine. You know, they, they, it's actually helping me. You know, they roe really like the little young shoots of bramble. That's one of their favourite um, <laughs> favourite bits of foliage. So no, it's it's completely fine. Like, completely fine. Perfect. Um, do you, Christopher have? Triados. Oh. oh yes, there's a there's just a chat um, about making sure that you use ethical banks. Um, so that's one of the banks giving money, Triodos, whoever they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher is asking, do you have 
Do you have any areas of scrubland that you developed through natural colonization or is that something that you created yourself? Um, I think that the scrub came through naturally on yours. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 you know, things, yeah. It, it, there are, in fact, there's a couple of areas where there are, uh, uh, there's one or two areas which I've just not touched in the whole time I've been there. And just to sort of watch that successional growth, um, there will be other areas as the land goes into its next phase. I've been dealing a lot with these trees. So dealing a lot with sort of this plantation woodland, not the six acre one, but the little whips and fashioning sort of different habitats. There'll be areas as we go forward that I will, I probably won't touch in, the, in for the rest of my life that I'll probably just leave. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, a question from Tony around the lake. Um, have you introduced flora to your lake or just waited it? waited for it to come on its own yeah tony fantastic question god what a waste of bloody money that was <laughs> so we spent about 1500 quid uh, and i had to drive all the way to gatwick airport to a fan they were fantastic they were recommended to me a uh, fantastic aquatic nursery and they're one of the few aquatic nurseries in the country that they do their own um propagation they have an all native species. They give guarantees about not bringing invasive species in. So clean plants. So I go up there with the trailer, fill it all up, spend all this money, um, and half of it died. <laughs> and I could, I, it, and, and it's interesting. I've got a friend who's got a rewilding project near Bruton in Somerset. And Patricia never buys any plants in. All the plants that I've got, she gets in time. So water birds will bring... Um, you know, they'll bring the seeds in on their wings, on their feet, they'll sort of indefecate them. Um, so no, it was a complete waste of money, really was. I wish I'd never done it. And in fact, I think I was misold. One of the reed types is really rampant. Um, so just just let nature do its thing. I, you know, I should have rewilded a closing <laughs> name. <laughs> um, and then uh, just a couple more questions because I'm aware of the time. Jane has asked... Um, did you have any invasive species in the woodland? They are plagued with 19th century laurel. Um, I've had no invasive species in the woodland. I've had invasive species in the pond. I've got a thing called Canadian pondweed. That's an absolute nightmare. That one of the water birds must have brought in. So no, there's no invasive species. Um, I've got a sycamore that's not really invasive anymore. It's sort of native, um, particularly with the demise of ash. So no, no, thankfully not. Perfect. And I'm just going to finish with a, a question of mine, um, if that's OK. Um, a lot of people on here will be starting their rewilding projects. Uh, what would you say was your number one tip that you wish you'd have known before you started out? Um, my number one tip, I wish we'd built a bigger lake. That would be my the one thing, you know, we, we had a budget and we've stretched that budget. I now wish, the interesting thing about a, a water body, there's a great book I quote um, in, my, in the little handbook called something like Oak, Oaks, Dragonflies and something written by a guy who did a rewilding project way back in the 70s in Cambridgeshire. And he makes the point that a, a lake wants to become a piece of ground. It wants to move back and become a solid piece of, of earth again. And so I'm constantly sort of having to work Ah, uh, no, in fact, I've got it. Sarah, let me move on. A different thought. I'll tell you what I, I wish I'd done. I wish we had made that lake we've got now slightly smaller and about two years ago dug another lake. And then in about three years' time, dug another lake. So I wish we had a succession of lakes and ponds across the land. That would be the one thing. That would So doing one big lake um, is less effective than having a series of lakes. So actually, as I now sort of talk and think, it's mm -hmm. that. That would be the yeah. one thing that I would do differently. And mimicking that succession, I guess you touched on it a little bit of with the grassland, having that phased approach. So you've got different successional led levels across your across the project creates more of a mosaic than having that single one. Yeah, absolutely, completely. There's somebody this this I mentioned Patricia who lives in Somerset. She I think has got ten lakes on her land. She's got forty acres, and she builds a new one about every three or four years. The first one she ever done ever dug. Is it's like an older car. It's this marshy, it's got sallow, 
all the it's amazing it's this thing that's just spongy and it's just wonderful you know and then she's got all the way through to the last one that she's dug which is this clean water body so yeah that that would be the one thing that i would change it would be that amazing so we've got to the end of our webinar so i just want to wrap up by saying thank you so much to jonathan for giving up his time this evening to come and share a wealth of information it's been absolutely fantastic and hopefully everyone's really um enjoyed listening about underhill wood and um yeah learned, learned, i've learned a lot from it i hope everyone else has as well um, i also just want to say thank you to millie who's been doing a grand job on the chat um sharing all of the references to the books that jonathan's been mentioning so thank you for that um, please do uh, have a look at the rewilding manual. Um, this recording will be shared out um, afterwards as well, so you get to watch it again. Um, and for anyone who didn't come, um, they can they can have a look at the recording. Um, and if anyone here isn't on the rewilding network and wants to join, please do go visit our website um, and please do uh, consider joining because um, we're hoping to do many more webinars um, similar to this one. So thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, and I Thanks, hope everyone thank has you. a lovely weekend. Yeah, you, yeah, and thank you very much, Sarah. Amazing. And, and just a, a call out to others: really join the network. It, the the the, the rewilding guys are amazing, and they do quite nice t-shirts. <laughs> yes, do have a look at our t-shirts as well. Yes, I go on to the two. shop. I got three. I like them. They're good. <laughs> and also while you're here catch us at the end of may we're going to be at the chelsea flower show um talking about the beaver garden there so anyone who's got an interest in beavers um we will be at chelsea so do keep an eye out for that as well are you taking beavers to the to chelsea no, no mimicking beavers uh, <laughs> rather than taking them unfortunately i think the beavers would possibly do a good job yeah, there yeah, but, um, we're not allowed <laughs> um so yeah thank you ever so much and i hope everyone has a lovely yeah. evening Brilliant. Have a nice Easter, everyone. Take care. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye. -bye.